Mark chapter 6, verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth two by two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Then he called his twelve disciples together, and gave them power and authority over all devils, and to cure diseases. So here scripture is teaching us that Jesus gave to his disciples, right, power and authority over all the devils. And he sent them out. And he said, go and do some work. I have a mission for you. Go out there, cast out the devils, and heal the sick. And I'm giving you all the power that you need to do it. Matthew chapter 17, beginning to look on verse 15. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire, and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. They couldn't cure him. Then Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. So here, Scripture is teaching us, right, that, that this man brought his child or his son to the disciples. And the disciples couldn't cure him, the Bible says, Scripture says. But when Jesus was handling the situation, Scripture says Jesus rebuked the devil and it departed out of him. So it was the devil cause, causing this problem in this individual. But the disciples couldn't cast it out. Well, the Scripture said that Jesus gave them all power. All power and all authority over all the power of the enemy. But yet they still couldn't cast out this spirit, this devil. Now, in verse 19, it says, Then he then came the disciples to Jesus apart in private and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you should have been able to do this. If you had faith in you, then you should have been able to do this. Now, the stories that I just shared with you from Scripture, right? These are written in the Gospels. And these are written before Jesus Christ was glorified. These are written before the dispensation of the church age. The church age started on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And here when we read these stories, right? This is before the Holy Ghost was outpoured upon believers. So when we look into here and we see the examples and what's going on in the Scripture here, we have to keep in mind, again, that this is before the church age. This is before Jesus was glorified. And, and I'll profess to you to take these examples, right, and to try and apply it in, in the church age, and to try and apply these examples nowadays. It falls apart. It will fall apart, because that's not what it's meant to do. This is teachings for us. These parables and, and these scriptures here in, in the Gospels are teachings for us about what Jesus did and what his disciples did. But again, this happened prior to the cross. And a lot of people don't seem to realize that. They just go into these scriptures and they read it and they say, oh, well, that happened back then, so it's going to happen this way now. And this is the way it's got to be now. Well, no, because when you read this again, this wasn't in the church age. What was transpiring here was not transpiring in the church age. It was a different dispensation of time. And it makes all the difference when you begin to understand that. When we look at the Romans, chapter 12, verse 3, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So here scripture is teaching us what? That God gives to every man a measure of faith, a portion of faith, a size of faith, and we read verse 6 of the same chapter. And it says, Having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion or proportion of faith. According to the measure of faith. According to the amount of faith that God has given us. So here scripture is teaching us, right, that God has given to us, to all of us, a measure of faith. It's not our faith. It's the faith that God gives to us. So if I jump back now into Matthew chapter 17, right? Where the Lord's rebuking his disciples. 
And the disciples asked him, Lord, why couldn't we cast out this spirit? Why couldn't we cast him out? He gave us power. And Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. Because you didn't have the proper faith. Because you didn't have enough faith. Well, then if I take scripture, right? It was God's fault. It was the fault of the Lord. The Lord didn't give his disciples enough faith in order for them to cast out this spirit. Isn't that what scripture is teaching, right? Scripture says in Romans that God's, God gives to every man a measure of faith. And here Jesus is rebuking his disciples, saying because you didn't have faith, you couldn't cast out that spirit. Oh, so the Bible's teaching us what? The Bible's teaching us that it was God's fault. It was God's fault that these disciples couldn't cast out the spirit, right? Is that the doctrine that's being brought forth? Is that the teaching that we find in the Bible? No, absolutely not. You can make it look like that, right? You, you can make it seem like that because I grab scriptures from the Gospels under a dis different dispensation of time and I combine it with a writing from Paul, which is in the church age. And I put it together and I make it look like scripture saying what? That it was God's fault. And I'm not making this up, right? I'm not making this up. In Romans it says that our faith that we have, it's a measure of faith that God gives to every man. Every man gets a proportion of faith and every man gets a size of faith, faith from the Lord. And here, Scripture is saying that, well, Jesus said you couldn't cast out those spirits because you didn't have faith. Well, then who's to blame, God? According to the Scripture, who's to blame? The disciples or you? Well, we'd have to say that the disciples were to blame, right? But, but see, that's not a proper spiritual teaching. And that's not a, a, a proper exegesis of the Scripture. And, and if you play around with, in this way with the Bible, you can get in trouble. And I'm showing you one measure here. So you have to be careful. When you get out there and you're going to talk about uh, fighting the devil and spiritual deliverance and, and spiritual warfare, because a lot of people like to like to talk about that. You get on YouTube, right? And you punch that in, uh, query in, in the search bar and thousands and thousands of videos will come up. And you got people saying all sorts of crazy things. And they're pulling out this scripture and pulling out that scripture, trying to justify what they're doing and trying to justify what they're experiencing. James chapter 2, verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So here scripture is teaching us a few things, right? It says that the devils, they believe. They believe that there is one God. All right, so are the devils saved? Are the devils saved? Are they in the kingdom of God? Because they believe that there is one God? No. So belief, belief doesn't save you, right? Just believing that there's one God, it doesn't do anything really for you. Because here scripture says, the devils also believe that there's one God. And we're not going to sit here and say, because they believe there's one God, it does something for them. No. But they believe in this one God and they tremble. So you want to know how, when the, the devil's afraid? You want to know how the devil's afraid? The devil's afraid of, of God. The devil is afraid of Jesus Christ. And he trembles at the sight of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus disarmed him. When Jesus was crucified and died, the Bible says that he, he went down there into the deep, right? And he took back the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And he took all power back from the devil. Scripture says, all power, Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Jesus holds all power. So there's no power left for the devil. And that's why the devil trembles. But here again, Scripture says, thou believest there is one God. Now, now, many will say, well, I believe in one God. I believe in one God, one God. That's who I believe in. Well, not necessarily. Because if, if you believe that there's three persons to God, and each of these persons have a separate will, and a separate decision-making conscience, then, then it's not one. If you got three wills and three conscience, it, it equals three, not one. But if you believe God is one person only, Jesus Christ, and, and God is a spirit, and he's one, well, that's the, the scripture is talking about. That, what, that is what scripture is bringing forth here. There's one God. Not, not, not three persons to one God. Just one God. And again, if you want to claim to me, no, no, there's three persons in the Godhead. That's not what the scripture teaches. And, and you're stuck there. Why? Because you have to admit that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? They, they have their own will. They have their own ability to think. And you use the scripture, you say, well, Jesus surrendered his will. And Jesus wasn't doing the will of the Father. So it's showing you the capacity that Jesus has. What? He's separate from the Father. 
And if you have three persons that are separate, three persons that are thinking, three persons that are acting, then it's not one. It's not. No matter how much you try to say, it's a unity of one. Oh, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are, are unity of one. Well, they can't be. Why? Because they have separate wills. They have separate conscious understanding. Separate thinking abilities. If you're separate from something, you're separate from something. You can't claim it's one. You can't, you can't claim it's one. It's three. It's divisible. But here scripture says that if you believe there's one God, amen, then the devils also believe and they tremble. So that's the starting point of you dealing with these things. What? Believe in, in the one God. You have to believe in the one God. Not in a trinity of gods. And when your Holy Ghost filled, when you obey scripture, right, and the Spirit comes to fill you with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, then it's the Lord living in you. Then it's God come in the form of the Holy Ghost to live inside of you. And guess who the devil's afraid of? He's not afraid of you. He's not scared of you. He's scared of what resides inside of you. He's scared of what came to take up residence and to live in you. That's who he's afraid of. Prior to the day of Pentecost, men and women weren't filled with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost didn't come and fill men and women yet. His presence, was, his presence wasn't down inside of us in the church age. Only a select few, right? Going back into Old Testament times. The prophets of the Lord. The, the men who, who the Lord chose. But now it was coming for all of us. But even back then, when the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Ghost, was in these men, these prophets, right? Jesus hadn't disarmed the devil yet. Jesus hadn't been crucified yet. That, that, that kingdom still had power back in the Old Testament. That, that kingdom still had authority back in the Old Testament. So here's another little trick for you. Here's another little truth for you. If you're going back into the Old Testament, right, and you're looking at the interactions uh, of how the devil operated and the things the devil did, and now you want to pull that operation and pull what you see back in the Old Testament into the New Testament times, well, you're doing something wrong because you're looking at a kingdom back there that still had power. You're looking at a kingdom back there that, that, that hadn't been disarmed yet. It hadn't. It only became disarmed when Jesus w w walked down into the pits of hell and said, here I am. I just died up there on the cross and now here I am in spirit. And give me those keys, devil. And give me back the, 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 the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Let's go. You got no choice. I've paid the price. You're no longer the ruler. I'm disarming you. So understand that if you look back in the Old Testament, right? and you see operations of the spiritual realm, don't pull them into the New Testament. Why? Because it's a different dispensation of time. It's a different enemy that you're fighting. He's operating from a different capacity. In the New Testament, I just showed you, right, where the Bible says that this guy is now trembling. Trembling. You ever been in fear? You ever had fear come upon you? So bad that you tremble and you shake because you don't like what you see and you don't like what's coming your way? Well, that's how, that's how the devil is now, today. And when I say he's disarmed, he's disarmed because of the Lord. It's the Lord who sits in the position of power now. It's the Lord who has all power now. Not you, not me, not your prayers, not my prayers, but the Lord. Acts chapter 16, verse 16. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. So this woman, she had a spirit of divination in her, and she used to prophesy. She used to speak things, and by speaking these things, she brought her master much, much gain. They must have paid her for her prophecies. They must have paid her for the things that she was d d divining and the things that she was teaching and bringing forth through this spirit. Now this woman, the Bible says, the same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which shows unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. So for many days she followed Paul and the group, right? And what was she crying? Was she crying out lies? Was she crying out things that were not true? Scripture says that this is what she was crying. She was saying, these men, Paul and the group, they're the servants of the Most High God. 
and they are showing us the way of salvation. So she was speaking truth. This spirit of divination, right, was speaking truth because that's who Paul and his group were. They were servants of the Most High God. And what were they doing? They were showing people the way to salvation. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 15. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, Satan's ministers, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. See that? So it's saying it's not a great thing that the devil's workers, right? They're going to transform themselves as a minister of righteousness. And that's what we're seeing in the scripture. That's what's taking place in the scripture. This woman, full of the devil, was following Paul and the group, and she was crying righteous things. She was crying the truth. She was crying that these men are servants of the Most High God, and they're showing us the way of salvation. And she kept on doing it, and doing it, and doing it. And what does Scripture say? But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Did the Holy Ghost tell Paul to do that? Did Jesus Christ direct Paul to do that? What motivated Paul to do that? What caused Paul to do that? What does the scripture say? Paul being grieved. He was grieved. He was upset. He was disturbed. He was bothered by what was transpiring. And he turned to the Spirit and he spoke to it. And in the name of Jesus, he said, come out of her. Oh, great victory. Hallelujah. Great victory. I'll profess to you right here that this was something Paul did. This was a decision Paul took on his own. It doesn't say the Holy Ghost did something. It doesn't say the whole doesn't say the Holy Ghost directed Paul or told Paul to do it. The reason why Paul did it is because of what he was feeling. Because this woman was following him around and he was seeing what was transpiring and it bothered him. It grieved him. And that happens many times. I can testify from my own eyes, from my own experience, from what the Lord allows me to see and the things the Lord exposes to me, that when you see these things in operation and when you th you see these things at work, whether in the church body or an individual's life, it grieves you, it upsets you, makes you sad, ma makes you want to do something, makes you want to say something, but those are emotions. And those are feelings. And we're not to be led by our emotions. And we're not to be led by our feelings. We're to be led by the Spirit. And we're to be led by the Lord. And until thus saith the Lord, you're not to do anything. You're to bear it. You're to carry it. So according to Scripture here, right, don't come and tell me that a person who's possessed with a spirit of divination can't speak truth, can't, can't speak Scripture. Because we see it right here. This woman, who had a spirit of divination in her, what was she doing? She was speaking truth. That's what she was doing. She was speaking truth. And in doing so, she was masquerading as a servant of righteousness, as a servant of the Lord. Paul and the group knew she wasn't, but nevertheless, that's what she was doing. It can get very confusing out there. How you can get people coming to you and, and professing that they're teaching you the kingdom of God, but, but they're not teaching you from the Holy Spirit. They're teaching you from a different spirit. And let me tell you something. And let me share something with you. And you better take this to the bank. And you better realize that what I'm saying to you is truth. Because a lot of you are under, under this out there in the world right now. When, when people come to you, right, and they want to give you a book, and they want to get your focus off of the Lord Jesus Christ, and onto the devil, and onto the spiritual realm, and make make you call yourself a ministry of deliverance, and a ministry out there that goes and, and fights the devil. That's not the will of God. That's not what we see in the New Testament time. We're not called to speak in that way and act in that way. Yes, the body is used against the devil, but, but the body is used against the devil in a spiritual way. And, and, and it's the Lord that does the work.
Amen. When the Spirit of the Lord is flowing, right? And the Spirit of the Lord is moving. Then He'll stir up these things. And He'll move against these things. And yeah, when you're in a service, or when you're helping someone to break free, you're going to have to pray, pray a prayer against it. You're going to have to command it to leave. But you have to command it under the power of the Lord. And again, if you're not separated from the world, and you haven't surrendered your heart, your old stinking heart, and your old stinking will to the Lord, and you want to come up and cast out a spirit, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Jesus won't be there with you. Oh, you may get a show. You, you may get a show. Makes you believe that something just happened, that the devil was just rebuked, but all you got was a show. And you can't run back into the scripture in, in, in the Gospels that say, well, if Satan casts out Satan, then he's divided and he can't stand. And so therefore it was, I actually casted out Satan. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. You didn't. You're just looking at the scripture and trying to justify yourself. How do you know it wasn't a show? How do you know it wasn't Satan just pretending that he was cast out? And, and now he, he just separated his function, separated his operation. So the fruit of his operation and the fruit of his, of his function is not manifesting in the body. And you're taking that as he's gone. But he's not. The Holy Ghost doesn't point you to Satan. The Holy Ghost doesn't cause you to walk around and see Satan here and Satan there and Satan just everywhere. The Holy Ghost points you to Jesus. The Holy Ghost points you and shows you the kingdom, the kingdom of the Lord. And, and, and if the enemy comes your way, yeah, then you're going to deal with him. Then you're going to have to deal with him and wrestle with him and, and fight with him according to the scriptures. But if you gain victory, it's because the Lord gave you victory. Not because you said a special prayer. Uh, not, not because you, 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 you read a special prayer from a book and, and that made the devil leave. No, it's by the power of the Lord. So let's get back to Paul here, right? Paul being grieved, makes his own decision. Great, great Apostle Paul. The great Apostle Paul. And, and I do believe he's great, amen. And I'm not picking on him. But I'm showing you even he's a man. Just like I'm a man. And you're a man. Or a woman. And you're subjected to your own choices. And your own decisions. And when you fall that way and you, and you make those choices with your own will, you're going to reap from your choice. You're going to reap what you did. So Paul, being grieved, turns around and says, Spirit, get out of her. What he's saying is, leave us alone. Stop saying these things. Stop following us. Stop bothering us. And you know what? I've had that experience. A few times. A few times. Hey, one time a spirit came, came to me on the road. I was getting to get on the bus. And he came to me and he began to speak to me. And he started saying, oh, the things that you know. And the things that the Lord is showing you. Uh, you better you better never leave the Lord or we're going to kill you. You better never leave the Lord or we're going to get you. And he followed me onto the bus. And he followed me down into the metro. And he sat there and he kept speaking these things loudly to me, looking at me. And people around were hearing this guy. And they're saying, what the heck's this guy talking about? They thought it was a human being. They thought it was flesh and blood speaking these words. And he, he kept saying that. And the Lord, and, and I wanted to say, get off me. Leave me alone. Stop doing this. I wanted to rebuke it. I did. But the Lord didn't tell me to. He didn't give me any direction. So I put up with it. And then finally to a point in the metro, the Lord spoke to me. and said, you tell this thing to be quiet and stop following you now. And I looked at it and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, close your mouth and stay there. And stay there. And guess what happened? He closed his mouth and he stayed there. Amen. But it wasn't my decision. I, I wanted to do it. I wanted to do it from the first time it came up to me and began to speak to me. I wanted to say, leave me alone. I don't want to hear it. I know who you are. Get away from me. But, but that's my will. It's my choice. And if I claim that I'm being led of the Lord, then the decisions that I make have to be made from thus saith the Lord. And I had no scripture. You don't have scripture to say, well, when a devil just comes and you're grieved and you're upset because the devil's manifesting and doing this, go and rebuke it. No. Some of, some of us don't even have the power in us to rebuke these things. Why? Because Scripture says some don't come out but by prayer and fasting. Right? And some of you haven't fasted for 20 years. And some of you haven't fasted for 10 years. And, and you want to go and try and run up against one of these things. Better be careful. We're not to be focused on them. Our focus to be, is to be on the Lord. 
But nevertheless, Paul being grieved, made a personal decision because of how he felt. And he said, Spirit, get out of there. Oh, wonderful. And look what happens to Paul, right? We use this scripture. We use this chapter. Oh, Paul and Silas, they were in the deeper parts of of the prison. And they began to praise and sing worship songs to the Lord. And the Lord delivered them. What a wonderful work. What, what, What wonderful things happened. Amen. Praise God for helping them. Praise God that grace and mercy fell upon them. Because they put themselves in that situation. They put themselves in that situation by their own choice, by their own will. It was Paul's fault. He was upset. He was disturbed. He was bothered by the Spirit. And he, he went after it. Because he knew he could. Because he knew he had power over it. So he went after it. But again, Scripture doesn't say the Holy Ghost told him to do it. Holy Ghost didn't tell him to do it. Paul's emotions made him do it. And look what happens. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains were, was gone, oh boy, he just rebuked the Spirit out of that woman. And now we can't use her anymore. And now she's worthless to us now. They caught Paul and Silas. They laid their hands on him. They grabbed him and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought, brought them to the magistrate, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, because we are Romans. So they started laying charges against him. Why? Why? Because of what Paul just did, right? Because of the actions that Paul just did, now he's finding himself in trouble. In trouble. Oh, but he cast out a devil. Yeah, because of his own will. And now he's finding himself in in, in trouble. And scripture says, And the multitude rose up together against him. The group. Whole group of them. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. To beat them. Oh, wonderful, huh? You want to get out of the will of God. Uh, you, You want to be out of the will of God and make a decision based upon how you feel. And based upon how your emotions are leading you. And because the situation is not so good. But you haven't heard, thus saith the Lord. And and when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison. Charging the jailer to keep them safely. Oh, well, well, how come they got beat up? How come they had many stripes upon them? Right? How how come they were commanded and they had to get beaten up? What was the reason? Oh, because they were preaching the word of God. Right? That's why. Because they were out there preaching the word of God and that was a consequence of them preaching the word of God. No, that's not why. It's because Paul made the decision out of his own emotion to cast out that spirit. And when he did that, he made her masters upset. Not because he was preaching the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ and repentance and and, and come into the kingdom and believe on the Lord. That's not what upset the masters. What upset the masters, what? The spirit's gone now. Look what these guys just did to us. And now Paul and Silas are suffering the decision of their own will. Of their own will. The book of Acts, chapter 13, verse 6. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from faith. All right, so now here, here's a different type of story, right? Here's a sorcerer, a false prophet, right? And there's a spirit in this individual also, right? But, but look what the spirit's doing now. The spirit's no longer crying truth. Not saying, listen to these men. They're they're the men of God. And they're teaching the way unto salvation. Scripture says here that this guy sought to withstood them. Seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. Set his eyes on him. So what motivated Paul to address the Spirit this time? Was he grieved? Was he upset? Was he bothered? Was it an emotion that led him to do that? No, right? That's not what Scripture says here. Scripture says Paul filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Now he set his eyes on him. And said, O full of all subtility and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, 
will thou, will thou not cease to pervert the ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. So Paul addressed this spirit now, right? Paul addressed this man, right? But we know what was inside this man. The Bible says he was a sorcerer. He was working with magic. He was working with the devil. This spirit, though, was working against the Lord and trying to oppose the will of the Lord. He was trying to prevent them and trying to, to stop them from bringing faith to the deputy. And so the Holy Ghost moved in. And so God started to move, right? And that's why scripture says Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost. And after being filled with the Holy Ghost, it means when he says filled with the Holy Ghost, it means stirred him up, spoke to him, spoke to him, led him. And then Paul set his eyes on him. And what did he do? He said, now the hand of the Lord is upon thee. Look at how he's talking. And thou shalt be blind. He says, you, you, you won't stop perverting the ways of the Lord. You won't stop coming against the Lord. And now the hand of the Lord is upon you. And the Holy Ghost is showing me this. And this is what's going to happen to you. Big difference, right? It wasn't Paul's emotion that led him here. It wasn't Paul's emotion that caused him to take these actions. No, it was the Holy Ghost and the Lord. Now look what happened after this took place. Verse 12. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Huh? Paul didn't get beat up. Paul didn't get striped. Paul didn't get thrown in jail. Paul didn't have something bad happen to him. What happened? Something great happened. Something wonderful happened. Another soul came into the kingdom of heaven. Right there, when the deputy saw and believed and followed, guess what happened? There was a party in heaven. The angels started dancing huh? and celebrating. Huh? All right, another soul into the kingdom. Another soul being saved out of the hand of the enemy. But, but two different stories, right? Two different situations, right? One, one situation, mm, the will got in the way. Emotion got in the way. Feelings got in the way. And, and it's okay, right? We need to hate the devil, amen. And we need to be against the devil, amen. But, but it's not our fight. It's not our fight. We got to fight the fight, yeah, but it's not our fight. It's the Lord's, right? We can do nothing. We can do nothing without the Lord and the Spirit of the Lord. And if we try, we get ourselves in trouble. We get ourselves in trouble, just as we saw with Paul. He got himself in trouble. Why? Because he let his emotions take control of him, over him. He let his feelings take control over him. And he paid a big price. Big, big price. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Seeking who he can get a hold of. Seeking whom he can hurt. Seeking who, whom he can take advantage of. I, I bet Paul would have liked to, to read this, huh? I, I guess Paul would have liked to, to read this and apply this before he made that choice, right? Uh, we re again, we read that. Oh, they were in the, the jail cell and they worshipped the Lord and they got free. Yeah, but look how much they suffered. Look how much they suffered. Why? Because they made a choice out of their own will. And that, that, that adversary, the devil, right? He was looking for that. that. That adversary, the devil who walks around like a roaring lion and seeking seeking who he can get a hold of, he was waiting for that. Waiting for that. Right? Many days. The scripture says, many days. She sat there and saying those things. Many days. Patient, right? Patient hunter. James chapter 4. Verse 7, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It doesn't say go out there and cast him out. By the authority of the Lord, and, and in the name of the Lord, uh, I resist you, devil, and the devil down there the road, and the devil down there on, on that road, and, and the devil high place here. Uh, in the name of Jesus, get out of here. That, that's what these guys are teaching. That's what all these spiritual warfare books are teaching. And these men are not filled with the Holy Ghost. 
And these men are not in the kingdom of God. And you know, you know what's leading them? That same spirit that, that was inside of that woman that got Paul in trouble in the first place. That's the same spirit that's in these people. Whether you want to believe me or not, I, I know what the Lord has shown me. And I understand what the Lord has shown me. And, and that's scary. It's scary. And, and what do they point you to? They point you to the devil. They point you to the kingdom. Is the devil under the chair? Is the devil in the shower? Is the devil in my cupboard? And I don't mean that literally, right? But, but they're making you look at people and say, Oh, you have the devil here. You have the devil there. You have the devil there. You know what scripture says? Everyone who commits sin is of the devil. Everyone. So you know what scripture is saying? Everyone has devils in them. Everyone has devils in them. If you're not born again, if you're not in the body of Christ, and the Holy Ghost hasn't come to live inside of you, then guess who lives inside of you? A devil. A devil. So of course they're going to be there. Now, is it the will of God for you to see this? Is it the will of God for you to go look at every day of your life, looking around and seeing devils here and devils there? No, it's not. No, it's not. The Holy Ghost doesn't point you to that. Scripture says the Holy Ghost points you to the Jesus Christ and testifies about Jesus. Not about the devil. Not about his kingdom. Yes, there are times that, that you teach and, and you bring forth the truth about the enemy and against the enemy. Not every day. Not every hour. That's not your, your focus of your ministry. Show me once in Scripture where there's anything called a deliverance ministry. Huh? Nothing like that in Scripture, right? We have the fivefold ministry that Paul left. The fivefold. And within that ministry, yeah, you have the operation of what? Being able to deal with the devil. But again, it's not something that you focus on. It's not something that you live your life on. Okay, today I'm waking up and let's go break some strongholds. It's not your business to break the strongholds. That's the Lord's business. When you're going to wrestle with a spirit and you're going to fight against something, well, that's when it comes your way. And, and Scripture says to us what? Here in James chapter 4. First of all, you got to submit yourself to God. You're going to be out there under the spirit of Jezebel? You have makeup on your face and you're wearing worldly clothes and you're listening to worldly music and you're entertaining your flesh and you're living for your flesh and then you think you're going to be able to resist the devil? You can't resist the devil one bit. You know how Jesus resisted the devil. You know how Jesus fought the devil. Go see what scripture says. I'll give you a little hint. He did it through the, the spirit of holiness. He did it through the spirit of holiness. That's how he did it. And that's why here scripture says, submit yourselves to God. Because if you submit yourself to God, you're going to consecrate yourself to the Lord. You're going to come out of the world. You're going to be separate. And you're not going to touch the unclean thing. And by doing that, then the power of God is going to be in you. And the presence of God is going to be inside of you. And then all you have to do with the help of the Lord is resist the devil. Resist him. Not rebuke him. Oh, in Jesus' name, get out of here. Oh, I bind you in the name of Jesus. Devil, that, uh, who are you? What function do you have? What are you doing here? Oh, you can't have her. She's under the blood. None of that. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He'll leave. He'll go away from you. How do you resist the devil? You resist him in prayer. You resist him in, in fasting. You resist him in reading the word of God. You resist him in going to church. You resist him in worshiping. You resist him in, in, in encouraging the preacher and, and, and lifting up the word of God when the preacher is preaching the word of God. When it comes out of his mouth, you exalt it. Praise God. Amen. That's the truth. I believe it. What are you doing? You're lifting up the word of God. You're extolling the word of God. And the devil hates the word of God. There's many things that you do to resist the devil. And when you resist him, then he flees from you. But if you have a Paul experience, right? And how many, how many experiences do you find in the New Testament time? Of the disciples or of the, of the believers actually fighting the devil. You don't, find, you don't find very much examples, right, of that. You, you find a lot of examples of the Lord teaching us how to overcome the devil and how to resist the devil. 
But when you look in the book of Acts, right, which is the video, uh, if you want to say the video playing of the new church, you don't see many times, oh, the, the disciples got up and, okay, where's the devil? Let's go and fight the devil and it's time to fight the devil. No, they weren't focused on that. They were focused on preaching Jesus, preaching the truth. And if, the, if, if these things showed up, well, they weren't even supposed to deal with them unless the Lord told them. And we see it in Scripture, right? Paul got, Paul got him and Silas in trouble. Because instead of waiting for direction from the Lord, he, he made a choice of will from his emotion, from how he was feeling against Satan. And Paul knows Satan a lot. When you read the New, the New Testament, you see Paul's very, very, very familiar with Satan, right? He gives us direction on how to fight Satan. And he even says that there's times that I'm going to turn saints over to Satan so Satan can have their way with him or her and destroy the flesh so that the soul might be saved. So Paul, Paul wasn't ignorant. And scripture says what? We shouldn't be ignorant neither of his devices, right? Paul wasn't ignorant. But nevertheless, what happened? What happened? The flesh got in the way. The feelings and the man got in the way. I like how Jude describes it for us. I like how Jude gives us an, uh, a sight, insight into the spiritual realm and into this battle that's going on. Yet Michael, the, arch, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, does not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord rebuke you. And we see the same thing with Paul, right? In Acts chapter 13. When it was the will of the Lord, the Holy Ghost came upon him and he said, and now the Lord will do this to you. Not my prayer, not my speech, but the Lord is going to do this to you. Second Corinthians chapter 2 and 11. At least Satan should get advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So scripture is saying again, right? Satan's trying to get advantage of us. And he's using devices to do this. And we're to resist him. And we're to wrestle against him in the spirit. Amen. In the Holy Ghost. And when you're in the spirit and in prayer, right? Well, who's praying through you? Are you doing it? If you think you're the one praying, well, you better go and watch my video and, and learn about what prayer is. Because when you, when you pray, right? You need to pray always where? In the spirit of the Lord. The Holy Ghost has to take over. The Holy Ghost has to lead you in prayer. And so when you get down to pray, right, it's, it's thy will, Lord, and you're in control, Lord. You're in control. I don't need to know everything. I don't need to know and understand everything. And I'll give you an example. This week, a Sunday morning, I was at a church, and, and the Lord was moving. And the Lord spoke to me. And, and he had me pray for a man that was at the altar. And I prayed for him. Didn't tell me what to pray for. Said, John, go and pray for him. Go and pray for him. And I prayed for him. And I spoke in tongues. And, and I felt things breaking off of him. And, and I felt spirits leaving from him. And the Lord said, enough, stop. They didn't, didn't say nothing. Didn't address the spirit. Didn't say, Satan, get out of blah, blah, nothing like that. Just obeyed the Lord. And when I put my hand on him, the Lord took over. The Lord took over. And I looked up and another man was down. He, the drummer. He's a drummer in the church. He was down on his knees praying. And the Lord said, go pray for him. Okay, I'll go pray for him. Walked up to him, put my hand on him. Holy Ghost took over. Took over. Prayed a couple of minutes. Lord said, stop. Enough. Okay, stop. That's it. I felt the power of God. Felt the power of God, of God around me. Amen. But didn't think much of it. Just obeying the Lord. Come back Sunday night. Guy comes running to me. Comes up to me. He asked me, hey, what did you pray for? What? Well, what did you pray for when you prayed for me? I said, I don't know. I said, to lift your burden? I figured that's what the Lord was doing. Lift his burden. That's what the Lord wants to do. Lift your burden. He said, when you put your hand on me, he said, there was a heat that came over my body. He said, for three weeks, I've had this bad trouble in my back. Bad, bad trouble. And when you put your hand on me, there was a heat that came over me. And as you prayed for me, it left. It's gone. And you want to know, what did I pray? Like through my magic prayer or my magic words that I did something. I didn't do nothing. The only thing that I did was make my heart available for the Lord. The only thing that I did was allow the Lord to live in me. 
and allowed the Lord to direct me. And the Lord healed him. And you would look at it as a miracle. But it wasn't through my own power. It wasn't through my own wisdom. It wasn't through my own words of prayer that happened. It was my obedience to the leading of the Lord that caused that. The Lord chose to use me in that way. Amen. I could go deeper into that. doesn't matter. But it was my obedience to the Lord. And he didn't tell me what he was doing. And he didn't show me what was happening. He took the glory. 